got a major concession when President Trump agreed to meet with him. But I think the risk is worth it. Some North Koreans, they hide the fact that they're from North Korea. Pull one out for the World Wide Web, because net neutrality dies today. After Italy and Malta said they wouldn't give harbor to a ship carrying 629 migrants, including children and pregnant women, Spain said they could come to Valencia. Italy's anti-immigrant government, which has also borne the brunt of the migrant crisis, took it as a victory. In a 5-4 to four decision, the Supreme Court ruled that Ohio's methods for deleting people from voter rolls is legal. That process starts when someone hasn't voted for two years and doesn't respond to a mailing from the state. Civil rights groups say the ruling will make it easier for states to make it harder for people to vote. For the first time, the NCAA will have to answer questions in front of a jury about the risks football players face by taking repeated blows to the head. While many previous lawsuits have resulted in settlements or dismissals, a trial has now begun in a case alleging negligence and the wrongful death of former Texas Longhorn star Greg Plotz. Plotz had the most severe stage of the neurological disease known as CTE when he died. The film industry has been criticized for being too white and male, and a new study has shown how much the problem also extends to movie critics. Stacey Smith, who created the term inclusion writer, co-authored the research, finding that across nearly 20,000 reviews in 2017, nearly 78% were written by men, and 82% were written by white critics. While President but Trump called for Russia to rejoin the G7, Russia should be in this meeting. Why are we having a meeting without Russia being in the meeting? It seems and his Treasury Department hasn't gotten the friendship memo, placing sanctions down. on five Russian companies and three individuals who the department says worked with Russia on ways to conduct cyber attacks against the U.S. It's the department's second round of hacking-related sanctions against Russian actors in three months. President Trump and Kim Jong-un are both on the ground in Singapore, preparing for their big summit. The proceedings have now been shortened to just a few hours. And so far, all we've really seen is Kim going for a surprise walkabout and posing for a selfie with Singapore's foreign minister. The real action will happen tomorrow morning local time. First, Trump and Kim will meet one-on-one, -on -one with translators, and then with top aides from both the US and the DPRK. After that, the teams will have a working lunch. Hi. Nearly all of that discussion will be off camera. So how might these early rounds of diplomacy actually go down? Vice News asked four experienced American diplomats to simulate a real negotiation, with two of them taking on the North Korean side and two negotiating for the U.S. North Koreans don't believe in concessions or compromises. You're talking about a culture that exists on hostility to the United States. There have been many difficult negotiations, and we have to be very careful that we, we walk in there with a list of things that we think we need to do to make it successful. We come here having both of us lived through a very dangerous year, 2017, in which there were exchanges that suggested to us we were at various times on the brink of war. There's something that is front and center on our mind, and that is the nuclear weapons program in North Korea and the ballistic missile program. Uh, both these programs have been destabilizing to the region, threatening to our allies and to the United States, unnecessary for the security of the DPRK. And we hope that we can get to a position of what we would call denuclearization. We, in all agreements with the United States under the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, have said we support a nuclear-free Korean peninsula. And you have not abided by that. And we believe that that means uh, full denuclearization on both sides. So if we want to denuclearize the peninsula, you got to do it. We don't have any nuclear weapons there. Our weapons are nuclear weapons, strategic nuclear weapons, and they are weapons that are deployed we believe, for the assurance of allies and to improve stability around the world. What we've been hearing in Pyongyang is comprehensive, verifiable, irreversible denuclearization. 
Let me just, for the record, say that's very offensive. I think it would only be reasonable that North Korea be permitted to retain some nuclear weapons capabilities so we could defend ourselves. Normal relations will require that the DPRK truly denuclearize. That means that you do, in fact, give up those nuclear weapons. We need that that all happen and that that material leave your country. Yeah. Your ally, the South Koreans, have come to us and say they favor a process, a step-by-step -step process, where we take certain steps to curb the use of our nuclear missiles, and in return, we have some reciprocal gestures from the United States. Is that your policy now, or is your policy full denuclearization first, we get rid of all our weapons, and then you start doing something nice? While we do want denuclearization, we recognize that that's something that is going to take some time and it's going to take some discussion. So you could feel confident that we do want a process that's going to be phased, but we are very serious about the issue of denuclearization. But one of the first things we need is a declaration, first, of what you mean by denuclearization, and second, you know, exactly how you would propose to have it occur in a way that meets our concern for monitoring and verification. In my view, there was not really a meeting of minds on the, on the definition of denuclearization. And obviously that's one of the biggest stumbling blocks. The United States has brought very, very difficult and painful sanctions for our people. We've become a poor nation because we have to protect ourselves from you by building our weapons, by building our military. I think in the process of denuclearization, the sanctions relief will be provided and you will get what you want, and it's what we want. We want a security guarantee. We've been at war since the Korean conflict, the armistice agreement. We believe very strongly a security agreement involves some kind of good faith effort on your part, the relationship with South Korea, your troop presence, your military exercises that threaten us, your entire posture in the region, which is mainly aimed at us. On the issues of troop presence and military exercises, these are issues that involve countries who are not here at the table, particularly South Korea, and we'd like to save those issues for another time and discuss that and not have that part of these negotiations. We need to really discuss a little bit more the issue of uh, the nuclear weapons. And we need to get some more discussion on that before we can move forward, I think, on some of these other issues regarding sanctions or security guarantees. We've been hearing this from North Korea for years about their security concerns, about their economic development assistance requirements. So it's, it is a two-way street, and I think North Korea is comfortable with an action for action, commitment for commitment process, so that they see something in return for their movement towards denuclearization. Put a timeline out there for normal relations. Uh, put a timeline out for uh, ending the Korean War. I mean, there are many things you could put out there that are very concrete. The only thing you put out that's concrete is denuclearization from the DPRK. Everything else is very obscure. How can we have an agreement like that? I think we have to work with what we are at the moment, trying to move forward in a phased approach, which I think is a, is, a, is a very logical way of trying to address this issue. It was my government that suggested to the president of South Korea that there be a summit to discuss our grievances. We released three of your prisoners uh, recently that uh, were committing unfortunate security acts. These are things that set the foundation for a future relationship. And these are things that set the foundation for, to build trust, and we need to keep doing these things. And that's what we should be focusing on. We also detonated and destroyed uh, Ambassador Gallucci, uh, a facility that I believe you know well. It is a gesture of goodwill. Who is making these positive gestures? It's not you. The great gesture blowing up a tunnel. My God. I mean, if that's what we're talking about here, blowing up a hole in the side of a mountain, that's nice, it's a good, good optic, it was fine. If you're gonna give, make a, a great gesture and give back prisoners, well, we can take prisoners so we can give them back too. What we should be about is figuring out the details of this that are gonna get us to a new place. We are prepared to move from an armistice to a treaty of peace. And what would make us move toward normal relations? Liaison offices. We need to have an agreement on a set of meetings that we will have after our meeting 
in which our experts get together with your experts and we talk about the armistice, then the Treaty of Peace, who's going to be present for that discussion, what other countries besides us too, right? That's, that's a reasonable thing to be talking about. We understand that there's still not a lot of trust um, between our two countries, and that's one of the reasons why, of course, we will need verification for anything that we agree to in the terms of denuclearization. Considering that for the last 25 years, we've yet to get a settlement on these uh, issues with North Korea. My interpretation is I'm hearing uh, President uh, Donald Trump say, let's change it and let's give North Korea what they've been asking for. They got a major concession when President Trump agreed to meet with them. But I think the risk is worth it. So yes, this is not the normal procedure, uh, but the normal procedure has not given us anything but a worse situation. So we may be looking at something that will give us a positive, hopefully a positive development. Trump's supporters and detractors will be watching to see how he does on the diplomatic high wire. But for one community in California, the stakes aren't political, they're personal. May escaped North Korea six years ago. She now lives in Koreatown, which hosts the largest population of South Koreans and North Koreans in the United States. But even in Koreatown, May lives a pretty lonely life. Can you tell me about the moment when you decided that you were going to leave North Korea? May paid a broker to help her cross into China. She thought she'd be getting a job at a restaurant, but the broker sold her into marriage, a common occurrence for women trafficked out of North Korea. She spent two years working at a brick factory before convincing the man who bought her to let her go back to North Korea. May escaped back to China, and out of desperation, she went back to the man who bought her. May eventually made her way to the U.S. Her son has since gone missing in North Korea. There are an estimated 50 North Koreans living in Koreatown, but they might never meet if it wasn't for Sarah Cho. Sarah runs a volunteer organization that provides North Koreans with services like ESL classes and help finding jobs. What's life like for a North Korean here in Koreatown? Some North Koreans, they hide the fact that they're from North Korea. They have this title as being third class citizens. And it's very unfortunate that among same race, you know, people of same language, color, and culture, you know, we have that discrimination go on. Do you think a North Korean would be happier living here in Koreatown in LA or say in Seoul? Here in Koreatown. Then really? Seoul, yes. Why is that? So I have North Korean friends in Seoul too. Mm -hmm. So what they tell me is 
here, at least if you go outside of Koreatown, if you're dealing with non-Korean people, when you go outside of um, Korean community, people just look at you as another Korean person. Sarah wanted to show me more of the community she works with, so she invited me to dinner. How was it? How do you taste? Um, masiso. Masiso. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever had to face discrimination in Koreatown for being North Korean? 예를 들어 제가 um, 직업을 잡았는데 맨 처음에 와서 아르바이트를 하는데 근데 제가 말 악센트 때문에 말 억양 때문에 어 저, 처음엔 조선적으로 오해했다가 나중에는 저의 정체를 알고 나서는 저를 좀 이렇게 어좀 존중 안 하고 저의 돈을 띠 먹으려고 안 주려고 했어요. What do you think of the summit? 김정은 예. 내보다 어려요. 조금만 너. 예? 요만한 너. 김정은이 죽여 버려야. 김정은이 이 미국 상대를 장난치는 게 시간 벌기. 북한, 코리아 핵 포기 안 해. 절대. 저는 통일, 통일을 바라는 사람이에요. 왜냐면 그쪽에 뭐 친척과 가족도 있, 있지만 통일되면 서로가 마음 좋게 이렇게 살아가는 게 좋잖아요. What North Koreans who've escaped the regime want most is for people back home to have a chance to survive. And that will require that Kim Jong-un do something more than just worry about his nukes. 핵 그런데 신경 쓰지 말고 왜 사람들이 탈북을 네가 막을 것이 아니라 탈북을 할, 하지 않게끔 한들 배불리, 배불리 먹이고 자유를 주고 먹고 살아갈 수 있게끔 해주면 왜 탈북을 하겠냐. In the days after ICE arrested 114 workers at a landscaping business in northern Ohio, advocates and lawyers raced to get in contact with them. Brian Hoffman is one of just 35 pro bono immigration attorneys in all of Ohio, where an estimated 83,000 undocumented immigrants live and work. One thing that makes Ohio unique is that our immigrant worker populations are less visible maybe than in other areas. There's a lot of dairy farms in Ohio, there's a lot of orchards, and so the people who work here in Ohio uh, at, at those businesses are, are just so much less visible because of how rural and how spread out everything is. Hoffman organized a handful of fellow attorneys to meet him at the for-profit prison in Youngstown, where 50 of the detained workers are being held. As far as I know, we'll be the first attorneys who've been able to visit these folks. So we're going to do uh, group meetings of about 15 people at a time to collect information about their situations and communicate to them what we can do for them and give them some general advice. I would much rather be arrested for a crime than arrested for an immigration violation, to be honest, because at least when you're accused of a crime, you have certain constitutional protections. I think what we might be able to do is just like huddle some people into a corner who need like more one-on-one -on -one conversations while we address the bigger group. The first question we have to ask people is like, is, any, is there anybody who doesn't know where your kids are? Because that's gonna be the most important. As the lawyers walked inside, security told us that we were not allowed to get any closer. Detention centers are notoriously opaque and don't, as a rule, allow cameras inside. It took eight hours to interview everyone. We've already started making phone calls to family members and have gotten in touch with a lot of folks. I was surprised to hear that many of the family members didn't yet know that their loved ones were detained in Youngstown. What does that fact tell you about the immigrant detention system and the larger immigration enforcement system? You know, unfortunately, it's telling me that the system is working exactly the way it's designed to work, which is as this opaque monolith that's difficult to get information out of, it's difficult to understand the inner workings of. And I, I, you know, I've been doing this for long enough to have reached the conclusion that that's by design. One of the men detained inside the Youngstown facility is Paz de la Torre's husband. Paz was working with him at Corso's Flower and Garden when ICE came. She has a green card and was allowed to leave, but her husband wasn't. She didn't hear from him for nearly three days. Hasta ayer, la madrugada, como a las tres de la mañana, le dieron la oportunidad de hacer una llamada para decirme, darme la información de que dónde estaba y qué número tenía. ¿Cómo te sentías en 
en esos primeros días sin poder comunicarte con tu esposo? Como si estuviera en un sueño. Yo siempre decía, voy a despertar. One of the places Baz has found support is her local church, where several of her co-workers from Corso are in the congregation. Their pastor, Elvin González, says he's bracing for the raid's long-lasting effects. It's already happened. It's been done. Damage in our community in this area. Now people doesn't, don't look at us the same. What do you mean? Because all they think that there is a Hispanic right there. Is he illegal? Because of what's going on. That didn't happen before? No, no. Now it's going to be before and after this. for the World Wide Web because net neutrality dies today. Now that the FCC's repeal has come into effect, the concept of a free and open internet will soon be a distant memory. Unless you live in Oregon, Washington, or Vermont. They've already passed their own versions of net neutrality legislation, even though the FCC's repeal order says states aren't allowed to make their own net neutrality laws. But if you live anywhere else in the US, then get ready to forget about net neutrality. Unless you live in Washington DC or any of the 32 states that also seem to be ignoring the FCC's wishes and have proposed their own net neutrality legislation. South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, Kentucky, Tennessee, Massachusetts, New York, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Montana, uh, Colorado, New Mexico, Idaho, California, Alaska, and Hawaii. But outside of those 32 states and DC and Oregon and Washington and Vermont, net neutrality is about to be very much a ghost of internet's past. Unless you live in any of the 123 cities where mayors have said that internet service providers contracting with their cities will still have to adhere to net neutrality rules. But if you don't live in any of those 123 cities or any of the 32 states or DC working on their own net neutrality legislation or the three states that already have, then as far as you're concerned, net neutrality is well and truly dead. Unless a federal lawsuit is successful. 23 attorneys general and about a dozen private groups, including Mozilla, Kickstarter and the Open Technology Institute, are arguing the FCC didn't have the right to repeal the 2015 rules in the first place. But if the federal lawsuit isn't successful and you don't live in one of the 123 cities or 35 states or DC, then all hope for net neutrality is sadly lost. So while net neutrality may be officially repealed today, we're not attending its funeral. Instead, we're entering a bold new era. Net purgatory.